But did you know that in the book of Numbers chapter 8, we're barely in the second year of coming out of Egypt. We're at the start of our wandering. And, and I'm going to have a tendency to say we, okay? Because that's us in the desert. That's us that came out of Egypt. That's us that crossed over the Red Sea. That's us that was at Mount Sinai and we received the covenant and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. That's us. Whenever you get saved, whenever you make covenant with Jesus the Christ, you have come into covenant with God. It takes you all the way back to the beginning at Mount Sinai and you have made covenant. That is us. Every church, every synagogue, and every, every, every place that teaches the truth of the Word of God knows that the coming out of Egypt is a type of salvation. Okay? It's a type of salvation. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here in this section here. Right? So we're in the book of Numbers, but we haven't even started wandering yet. We haven't started our 40 year wandering. I thought, man, that's a lot to read. And we still haven't even started wandering yet. We've come out of Egypt. We've gone through the Red Sea. That was all in Exodus. We go to the mountain and receive the covenant. We come into covenant with God and we say, yes. I thank you for saving me. I want you to be my Lord. Yes, I received the covenant. I'm good with it. Right? And then, books later, we begin to wander our 40 years of wandering in the desert. And that's also a type. That's also a type. It's the walk. That's what they were doing. They were walking. They were walking out this life. They were walking out the walk that we are walking now. How many of you guys want to live a nice long life? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm talking to the right group. Good. You want to live a nice long life. Now, how many of you want to live a nice long life excited about Jesus? Raise your hand. Okay, there was more hands. Than that. That's good. That's good. I'm in the right place. That's good. Okay? That's what I'm here to teach you today. That's what we're talking about today. You see, because it's real easy to be on fire in the beginning. Who remembers their beginnings? Anybody remember their beginnings? Anybody remember when you first got saved? How on fire you were? You couldn't wait to get up to the altar when that really special fast song came on? You couldn't wait to hug a brother or a sister? You couldn't wait to come to the... You couldn't wait till the doors were open to the church. You could not wait, right? And then we get older. We, we, we go through some things, right? We go through some things. We have some rocky moments. We start wandering in the desert a little bit, right? We start tripping over rocks. We start getting stung by scorpions. We start getting bit by snakes. Some little cactus in life stings us. And we're not as excited anymore, are we? Don't worry, don't have to say it. Maybe not agree with me. I know it's true. Okay? I know it's true. Sometimes time is not our best friend. It's not. Sometimes time can be our enemy. All you have to do is get married. I didn't know that. Now the announcements are coming up. Okay. But what do you mean? When you're first married, when you're first married, man, everything's exciting in the beginning, isn't it? You're learning everything about each other. And I can speak on this because I'm just recently married. Right? <laughs> everything's exciting. But what happens after a couple of years go by? What happens after, after some time passes by? After we put on a few pounds? passes by. After you're telling the same jokes over and over and over. I, I need y'all to pray for Maria. I really do. I need y'all to pray for Maria. Because she is hearing my same lectures and sermons and, and anecdotes every time she comes with me to go teach. So she's like, yes, I've heard this story before. And it's going to wear that poor woman out. It's going to wear her out. You get the fresh jokes. She's heard it a, she's heard it a week ago. She heard it yesterday. You know, She hears it during Shabbat. Time is not always our best friend. It's not. Even in our relationship with God. Even in our relationship with God. And that's why I titled this message, Why Live Life, the Christian Life, on Purpose. Now, if you go to Numbers chapter 8, everybody go to Numbers chapter 8. Just camp out there for a minute. Everybody go to Numbers chapter 8. Okay? What I like about certain Bibles, if you ever go Bible shopping, get yourself a boom. Okay? Get yourself a good one. You ever go Bible shopping? Get yourself a good one. My dad and I went Bible shopping the other day. She said, you know what? That's right. I need a new Bible. And I said, okay, well, let, let, me get her, let me get her a good one that has a lot of those little, little subtopics. I like the subtopics because you can kind of find out what's going to be going on, what's the theme of that section. 
I like notes. I like history. I like charts. I like maps. They really help you understand the text that you're reading. So I encourage you, if you're a student of the scriptures, spend a little money. Spend a little bit of money on a good Bible that's got some extra notes in it. What else do we spend money on? We spend money on all kinds of stuff. You can't spend a few bucks on a, on a good Bible to help you understand. Okay? Now we're going to go through the topics because in, in, in my scriptures, from 8 to 12, there's several subtopics. And I'm going to tell you that we're going to go over those subtopics real quick. We're not in the preaching yet. We're not in the preaching yet. So hang on. Hang on. I just want to set some groundwork. Right? So in Numbers chapter 8, as it goes on, the first subtopic, it talks about the menorah in the tabernacle. That lampstand talks about that. Then it talks about the cleansing of the Levites. Okay? It talks about that. It talks about the retirement of the Levites. That subtopic talks about that in that section. Then it talks about the cancellation of, oh, excuse me, uh, the celebration of the Passover. Not the cancellation of the Passover, sorry. Last one. <laughs> the, the, the celebration of the Passover. Then it talks about the cloud of the tabernacle. It talks about the silver trumpets. It talks about the tribes leaving Mount Sinai. And then in chapter 11, it talks about the people complaining. Okay? I know we have heard preaching after preaching after preaching and teaching after teaching on chapter 11, Israelites complaining. They are world famous in our churches about being the people that complain. Okay? But we're different. We're not like that, right? We don't complain, right? We don't complain. And don't worry about the amens. We don't complain. That's good. I like that. Now we're in chapter 11, okay? But we're not going to talk about any of those subjects, okay? We're not going to talk about any of those subjects. I just wanted to go over that real quick so we can get through the portion to where we want to be. Someone's going to ask you today, well, what did you guys talk about in church? We talked a lot about nothing. Nothing. We didn't talk about anything. We just kept going. Okay? But in chapter 11, now everybody go to chapter 11. And I believe it's verse 4. Let's see if we can get that, this up on the... On the screen, chapter 11, verse 4. Okay? And we're going to start complaining. Or we're going to, we're going to read about complaining. I was wanting tacos. I saw that. That's like, what? There's tacos? Okay, so this is the uh, HCSB. Okay? Now, contemptible people among them had a strong craving for other food. The Israelites cried again and said, Who will feed us meat? Go ahead and go to the next verse. We remember the free fish we ate in Egypt. So they remember the free stuff back in Egypt. Along with the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Go ahead and go to the next verse. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing to look at but this manna. Okay? Everybody say manku. Okay, that's actually how you say manna in Hebrew. But don't worry about it. Just keep man, that's good. Now, here we have at this point in time, we have these people, and they're looking back at Egypt. They're looking back at what they did. They're looking at the world. Okay, they're the Christians that are looking back at the world at what they miss, and look at what's going on. They're being contemptible to the provision of the Lord. The Lord is the one that rained down manna from heaven. Manna is what fed them. You see, the Lord took it upon himself to personally feed his people. Personally feed them. You don't have to do anything. I'm going to personally feed you. You don't have to grow crops out there. It's going to be kind of hard in the desert, so you don't have to do it. I'm going to personally feed you. But they got to a point, remember, this is only two years only two years in their walk. And they started complaining because some contemptible people started messing with their heads. Right? Let me ask you something. Before we get into that, do we walk our walk with purpose? I want to give you some practical application for this, okay? Before we even get into the message, I really want to give you some practical application. I want you to ask yourself. I want you to think this morning. Okay? I really do. I don't want to scream. I don't want to shout. I don't want to fuss. I want, I want you to take a, a minute right now. And I'd like you to think about your walk with God. Do you do your walk on purpose? 
Do you plan your walk? Your spiritual lifestyle, do you plan your walk? I'm going to read some of my notes because there's some good points here. Do we think about our walk with Christ? You see, every success guru will tell you, we do not plan to fail. We fail to plan. How many of you heard that before? Okay. Many of us have heard that saying before. But we don't apply it to our spiritual life. And that's a really important practical application to that. We don't plan our spiritual walk, do we? When we're doing our walk, we're milling about and we're waiting from Sunday to Sunday. The majority of us will wait with our walk, our spiritual, eternal, life-saving walk, and we will apply it from Sunday to Sunday. One Sunday I'm in church, punch in, do my thing, clap my hands, give my tithes, come in, listen to the pastor, listen to the preacher, read a passage, and I'm done and out the door. And that's what you've got until 12. Because we got to go. That's not a plan. It's not. It's a recipe for disaster. <clears throat> it's a recipe for disaster. I asked my youth one time, years ago when I was running a youth group, I asked them, I said, if you had, if you were brand new in a relationship, brand spanking in a brand spanking new relationship, right? In my case, that would be you're brand spanking new with your girlfriend, right? And you decided you're going to spend time with her one day a week. Sweetheart, we're going to spend time on Saturdays at 7 o'clock. And we're going to go out and I'm going to spend all kinds of money on you. I'm going to be affectionate with you. I'm going to take you wherever you want to go. I'm going to buy you whatever you want. You want. But the rest of the week is mine. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to text you. I'm not going to send you those really cute emojis and a little kissy face with a little heart on it. I'm not going to do all that. How long do you think that relationship's going to last? Mm. Oh, come on, ladies. How long do y'all think that relationship's going to last? <laughs> <laughs> the ladies should have been like, mm, mm, brother, no, uh -uh. no, I got better things to do with my time. You're going to have to send me some emojis. <laughs> it's not going to last. Why do we have this expectation? That if we come Sunday to Sunday, because I'm simply punching in my time here, that this constructs a relationship with God that's going to be strong. This doesn't. That's the truth. If we are coming Sunday to Sunday, if we are doing our relationship Sunday to Sunday, and we are only giving the Lord these two hours a week, I want us to correct our thinking. We're not living life with purpose. We're living life with, with, with the expectation. That we, we should have an expectation. That plan is going to fail. That's a miserable plan, Pacho. You're not going to have that girlfriend very long. That's just silly. She's not going to tolerate that. You will mess up your relationship. Now, God is a patient God. He is. We have stopped considering the long game. We really have we have stopped considering that we are going to live 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. I'm telling you right now, you are going to live a nice, long life. You're going to be a believer 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Have you planned that out? Have you planned it out? Have you actually stopped to think and consider what is my spiritual growth five years from now? What is my spiritual growth 10 years from now? What is my spiritual growth 15 years from now? Many of us in this room, we have a plan for everything else but our spiritual walk. We have a plan for our marriage. We have a plan for our education. We have a plan to pay off our house, our car. We have a plan for our kids. We make a plan for the next generation back, don't we? Many of us in this room probably have a savings account for our children so they can go to college. We have planned that out. Have we been diligent in our plan with God? We haven't. We haven't. That's a dangerous step. <laughs> Sorry. We don't plan our spiritual walk, do we? We don't think about it. We plan our careers more than we plan our spiritual walk. Okay, Pacho, so you've got me. You've got me. Okay, I don't plan my walk. 
Okay? But what about our plan with the walk for Christ? Does the Bible tell us anything? Is there a prayer plan? Let's get in our lives. Everybody go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Well, let me say half of y'all go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. The other half of y'all go to 1 Thessalonians 5.17. I'll let you decide which one you're going to go to. Who's got 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8? Just raise your hand. Anybody, anybody got it? Brother, read it for me.
problems that I have going on, my cultural worldview will, will try to filter that scripture. What little scripture I know, I need the scripture to filter my worldview. That's what I need. But do we have that plan? Is there a plan to serve? All the ministers should be saying, mm hmm. Is there a plan to serve? 1 Corinthians 14 12. 1 Corinthians 14 12. That's 
That's it. I was created to be Pacho Diaz. That's it. I wasn't created to be anybody else. I wasn't created to be anybody else. I was created to be the best version of me that I possibly can be. And I want to encourage you this morning, be the best version of you that you possibly can be. Be the godly version of you that you can be. Be there to encourage somebody somehow, in some gift, in some way. And then God's going to bring somebody else behind you to finish the work. Somebody comes along and they plant the seed. Somebody else comes along and they till the ground. Somebody else comes along and they water the seed. Everybody has a hand in doing the work, don't they? Amen. Amen. Is there a plan for spiritual growth? Everybody go to 1 Colossians 14, 1. Is there a plan for spiritual growth? I don't want us to miss the point here. Yeah, you know, of course, there's, I'm, I'm throwing out passages of scriptures about different plans and what have you. But the point is, is are you planning to grow? Are you sitting? I don't want us to get away from thinking. Keep thinking. I want you to ask yourself this morning. Am I planning to grow in Christ? Am I planning to grow in Christ? And we have to ask ourselves this, this honest question. It's an honest question. It's a question that deserves an answer. Because the walk gets hard, doesn't it? Yes. No, I'm sorry. What did I say? I said something. Yeah, 14, 12. First Corinthians 14, 12. 14, 1. I'm sorry. 14, 1. First Corinthians. Did I say Colossians? You said first Colossians. I did say first. Did I? That's horrible. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be up here teaching. <laughs> Open your Bibles up to your first doctrine, chapter 11. <laughs> That's horrible. See, there's always room for growth. Mm -hmm. Always room for growth. Well, that's that. Here we go. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and above all, that you may prophesy. I'm going to throw verse 2 up there also. For the person who speaks in other, uh, in other languages is not speaking to men, but to God, since no one understands him. However, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. So back to number one. Paul is talking about spiritual gifts, isn't he? He's talking about gifts of the spirit. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and above all, that you may prophesy. i gotta, I got to ask a serious question. I come from a Pentecostal background. When I first got saved, I started going to a Pentecostal church, and they are some excitable people. They really are. You want to you go to a, 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 an exciting congregation, go to a Pentecostal congregation, you will see people running up and down the aisles. Now, some people can't tolerate that. I, find, I found it, I actually found it really pleasing. I really did. I thought it was wonderful. They encourage you to pursue spiritual gifts. Now I've met people on many different levels of their walk, but I'm always shocked when I meet people that say they don't want spiritual gifts. I've had that conversation. I've had that conversation with people. I don't want spiritual gifts. I don't want to speak in tongues. I don't want to prophesy. I don't want to do any of that. Why? Do we really think that that our? Do we really think that this fight for our lives is is so easy? We can just give away a blessing. We can just set a blessing to the side. I encourage you, like Paul encourages you, desire the spiritual gifts. Correct your thinking today. If you ever listen to Joyce Meyer, she's always talking about having stinking thinking. Some of us have some stinking thinking, don't we? We have some, we have some weird thoughts running through our heads. I don't need your gifts, God. Keep those things. I don't want to look like a fool. I don't want to look weird. There's a Bible passage for that, isn't there? I guarantee you some people are thinking about that exact same Bible passage. I would rather be a fool for Christ than be wise to the world. Because as a fool for Christ, Christ will use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. But we want to look cool, don't we? We want to look cool. We want to look glamoured up. We want to look our absolute best. We don't want to talk about Jesus at work, with our children, at home. I don't want to make them nervous. 
I thank God for those Christians who are out there making people nervous. I really do. My brother, when he was on fire for the Lord, keep him in prayer. He's not quite on fire for the Lord as I would like him to be. But keep him in prayer. Okay? Prayer does things. When he was really on fire, he used to go to, uh, uh, I'll show you. He used to go to the Big Temple. Now, those guys are nuts. Those guys are on fire. I love those guys. They are excited about Christ. When I would get around my brother, that dude would make me nervous. He was just so in my face about Christ. But their success rate on getting people off of drugs, on getting people off of the streets, on getting people out of prostitution, on handling demonic influences, it was such a successful ministry that the President of the United States called Freddie Garcia up to receive an award for the work that he had done. That's impressive. That's impressive. I think we need to stop worrying about how cool we look and how good we look and start thinking that we need to start acting like fools for Christ. We really do. We really do. We need to change our stinking thinking. We really do. We need to start getting past ourselves and saying, this person in front of us needs me to talk to them about Jesus. I need to be able to use my gift to help in bringing light to a dying world. That's what we're called to do. Don't just get saved. Get out of Egypt and stay at the mountain. Amen. Get on that walk in the desert. Oh, yes. Get on the walk in the, in the desert because there's people out in the desert that need us. They need us to get off the sidelines, to get off the benches, and get on the field. Amen. They need us. I'll take the one amen then. You said, I'll take that one amen. I'm comfortable with it. I understand this is a hard message. I know, I know. I want George up here, up here too, and encouraging us and, and shouting and making us happy and making us joyful. But I also want you to grow. I want you to think today. I really do. Let's continue on with our message. Going back to the church, let's go back to the church for a second. We're still not even preaching yet. We're actually still, we're still just going, we're just getting the groundwork laid down, okay? Do we use the resources that we have in church? I, I know, Rodney, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm going to get us out of here. I promise. I promise. I'm just laying the groundwork, though, okay? Do we use the resources that we have in church? Well, we're talking about planning, okay? Now, some of you may be thinking about planning, like, you know what, that, that's a pretty decent idea. I think I'm going to start planning my spiritual walk. What do I do now? What are some practical things that I can do? Do you use the resources here? Do you use the resources that are available in your church? Okay. The men's group leader. Who's the men's group leader? Don't say it. Just, uh, don't say who you are. Somebody tell me who the men's group leader is. Anybody? Okay. <laughs> One person knows who the men's group leader is. <laughs> it's the women's group leader. Thank you for saving that point of the message. Okay. Awesome. Bob, raise your hand. If you are a man and you want to your hand, you want, you want to get connected and plug in and you want to grow and you want your spiritual walk to grow, get connected to the men's group leader. Go up to him and ask him, what resources do you have that I can use to make my spiritual life grow? I just want everybody to identify Bob. Okay? Where's the women's group leader? Who is it? Anybody know? Anybody? Oh, okay. Everybody's pointing. Everybody's pointing. Am I not with you? Would you raise your hand? That's the women's group leader, okay? This is practical application time, guys. Now, the women, I guess, it's for them. The women, we never hardly ever have to encourage. They got good stuff going on. They got good stuff. They got, they got the secret sister, right? They got all kinds of stuff. There, there is really, I mean, that's probably one of the best groups that we have. Everybody, every woman is involved in the women's group. And that's good. If you're a woman and you want to get connected and you want to grow, we should be going, or y'all should be going to Sister Luce and asking Luce, Sister Luce, what resources do you have? What do you recommend? I have questions. Use the experience that is in this church today. Who's the youth group leader? Man, we don't know anybody in the church, do we? <laughs> we really need to get off into this church. John, raise your hand. That's one of our youth group leaders. 
leaders. Now, I can't really point out the other youth group leaders because they're with the youth group, okay? It says, uh, it's Brother Tony and Sister Esme. Yeah. If you have questions about your youth, if you want your youth to be more, if you want a planet. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that you're going to turn your kids over to the youth leader and all of a sudden they're going to be a smoking pile of ash because of how on fall fire for Christ they are. But it does take a plan, doesn't it? It takes a plan. It takes a start. And if all we do is we come here on Sunday and we go home and we come here on another Sunday and we go home and we never connect to the spiritual people that we need and we are always connecting to the worldly people, we're setting ourselves up for fools. We are. If we never connect with one another, if we never connect with those people who are senior to us, what about the prayer warriors? What about the hands and feet guy? What about, about the raise your hand for me? Two up, raise your hand. This is a, this is what I call a hands and feet guy, right here. Two hands. Two hands. There you go. Uh, Just make sure that he has one of my hands. Two hands, hands and feet. For those of y'all that like to work, like to get involved, like to get grimy and dirty with your hands for the kingdom, ask this guy. Ask this guy. Get connected. Get plugged in. We're asking God to reveal us, reveal to us what our part in the body is. What is our part that we play in this church? I, I know we've heard it before. I sit here in these, in these, in these benches and I listen to the same messages you listen to. I really do. I sit here and I listen to them. But I, I'm asking you, do you ask yourselves these questions? Do you ask yourselves, what am I doing that I can grow? In Christ. Am I taking my spiritual walk seriously? Am I living it? Am I living my walk on purpose and with purpose? Okay. So, what if I don't plan on success? What then? We're susceptible to the onions. We're susceptible to the onions. Everybody remember that part where we're desiring the leeks, the onions, the, the food from the world? You see, that's what happens when you don't do something on purpose. You will fall back into the old patterns of our old ways. We will have this desire. I'm here to tell you, it is a normal, biological, physiological thing to think of your past patterns and to desire those patterns. It really is. If you were locked into some sin, it's normal for you to be sitting in these benches right now in this church to be thinking, you know what? I missed that sin. That's a very normal thing. That's very normal. What's not normal, what we shouldn't be doing, is going back to it. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. To think about it, that's the struggle, isn't it? That's the struggle. Everybody struggles. I struggle. I remember specifically having a conversation with God one time. Lord, you know what? I'm tired of this. To be honest with you, Lord, I've been doing this for too long. I've been trying too hard. Honestly, I've been getting my little tushy kicked, and I want to go back. I want to go back. I'm being, I'm being very honest with you. I've had this conversation with God. I want to go back. God didn't say anything. He was pretty quiet about it. And then when I started, I was like, okay, well, let me, let me go ahead and go back, and I'm going to go back to, uh, to what I used to do, how I used to live. And I had been walking with God for so long, I was like, I, I don't want to do that anymore. Like, I physically did not want to do that anymore. I realized I had nothing to go back to. I had maintained the pattern of a Christian walk for so long that I realized, without knowing it, I had changed. I had changed. Dwayne The Rock Johnson says this about working out. Okay? Everybody know who, who The Rock is? Yes. And all the amount of said? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> are way too quiet. <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson said this about working out. It's consistency. Period. Every day, every day, every day. It's consistency. Every day, every day, every day. When you make a plan, when you set a plan in motion, what you're going to do every day, 
you live a life of purpose. You're going to do it on purpose. Today I'm going to get up and I'm going to read my Bible. Today I'm going to get up and I'm going to get into prayer. Today I'm going to get up and I'm going to at least talk to one person about Christ. Today I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to work and I'm going to say, you know what? God bless you. After I help him out. Today I'm going to be kinder on purpose. I'm going to purpose to do it consistently every day, every day, every day. And you will watch yourself change and grow from who you were to who you're supposed to be. Amen. But many of us are so settled in with our struggle. We like the struggle. Let me get into my struggle here. Oh, Lord, I'm struggling again. Let's change. Let's go to that spiritual gym. I know I'm not exactly the biggest representation of it. Going to the gym. I get it. You're going to have to use your imagination on this one. Let's go to the gym. Ouch. Bible stand up for me. No, no, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Okay? All right, there you go. Let's go to the gym. Just stay right there. Okay? No, 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 no. Sit down. Let's go to the gym. Let's work out these arms. Let's work out these spiritual hands. Let's get them back in there. Let's get in there. How often do we do it? Thank you. Go ahead, sit down. Back to you. That's going to the gym? This is not. I want these examples to be real. I want them to stick in your mind. All right? Did you have a plan? I guarantee you Bubba had a plan. Probably even wrote it out. He's one of those guys that wrote it out. Okay, this is back day. This is bicep day. This is tricep day. Oh, leg day. Everybody needs leg day. Okay? Not just going for a walk in the park today and then I'm going to my screen. That's my plan. <laughs> All right, I'll get Froyo. I'll get Froyo just to make it that much better. What's our plan, though? You see the success versus not quite as much success. You see the change. It's a physical example of a spiritual reality. Are we planning this walk? Are we planning it? Or do we desire? Are we allowing the desire? Because like I said, it's normal. It's normal to desire the things of the world. These people were two years in the desert. They hadn't even gotten into the long haul of the walk yet. Mm. Two years in the desert, like, oh man, I gotta get back to the world. I gotta get back to Egypt because I miss the onions, I miss the leeks, I miss the free fish. Free fish, really? If I could go back and if I could go back and talk to the, to the Israelites, I'd be like, free fish, really? You need to tell me that Egypt, who you were enslaved to, who you were their slave, was giving you free fish? I find that really hard to believe. But what we do is we blow it up, don't we? Man, the world was awesome. It was fun. No, it wasn't. I remember the world. You see, I used to go to the club a lot. George can tell you he was there. Finally! Finally! Oh, music is awesome! I've been planning that one for months. I've been planning that one I remember what it was like. I remember the music. I remember the people. I also remember being broke. I also remember being hung over a lot. I also remember throwing up a lot. There's a beautiful picture. I also remember fighting with my girlfriend at the time and not understanding really what true relationships were about. What real love was about. Don't sit here and tell me about the world. I know about the free fish that the world offers. Mm. Don't tell me it's better than what I have now. You can't. You can't tell me that what I have right now is not better. Mm. I have a love relationship with my creator. I have a beautiful wife awesome kids. I have a home that I love coming home to. I don't have those struggles anymore. Oh, they don't exist anymore. Oh, yeah. But I'm going to be like, man, that free fish though. <laughs> no, it's not free. It will cost you. Mm. It will cost you. <sighs> but we begin to miss those things. I'm going to read directly from my notes. We begin to miss the things of the world. The lifestyle, the music, the movies, the language. The control of our own lives. 
the conviction-free ability to gratify me. The me philosophy of life. That's what we miss. That's what we miss. I love a lot of the conversations that I have with people. I, I talk with saved people, unsaved people. I, I listen. I love to listen. I, I will listen to your words. I'm always listening. People say some of the silliest things. Because we want to gratify ourselves. We do. We want to gratify this flesh. This flesh has a desire to be worshipped. Do you know that? Did you know that? That's, that's, that's the biggest thing, that, that's the biggest lie that the, the enemy is selling. The enemy is selling that he wants to be worshipped. But what he'll do is he'll translate it into, you deserve it. You deserve that worship. Everybody wants to love you. Everybody wants to give you things. Our flesh wants to be gratified by our own decisions and our own philosophy. Anybody know the number of the Antichrist? 666, good. Anybody know the biblical number of man? Six. Do you think it's a coincidence? Do you think that a co the coincidence of the quantified and magnified number of the absolute enemy is 666 and that man is six? It's not a coincidence. When we start gratifying our own flesh, when we say, God, I don't want to do it your way. I want to do it to please me. You're worshiping the enemy. That's what we're doing. We're worshiping the enemy on a very small level. And it starts with a desire to go back to Egypt. And what happens, what happens, what ends up happening is we start listening to the outside influences. If you remember, remember that passage where we were in numbers. Uh, don't worry about going back to it, it's good. It was, it was this uh, contemptuous people, okay? It was the outside rabble in some, in some versions. In the original Hebrew, it's the mixed multitude, okay? Remember that. It's the mixed multitude. I'm going to give you a little, a little lesson that, that you may have never heard before. It was not only Israelites that came out of Egypt. How many of you know that? It was not just Israel that came out of Egypt. There was a group of mixed multitude, the Bible says. People that were not Israel. Okay? Israel had their own problems, don't get me wrong. But it was not just Israel that came out. There was a lot of Egyptians that came out. There was a lot of ites that came out of, uh, of, out of Egypt. There was a lot of Now think about this. Think about this. Now really, really think about this. Okay? When, when God brought Israel out of Egypt... Everybody was watching Yahweh absolutely destroy Egypt. Do you think a lot of people wanted to stay? They're like, uh, no, it's probably better that I go along with these Israelites because their God is way stronger than these gods. So I should probably go with them. So there was a bunch of people that did not know Yahweh that walked out of Egypt. They are referred to as the mixed multitude. And normally where they camped out at was on the outer edge. Okay. They camped out on the outer edge of Israel. But it's these mixed multitudes that were causing problems. It was those outside influences that we think are really, really small. One of my, uh, a really good friend of mine, we work at, at, uh, at Bear County, uh, uh, Brother Camacho. He quoted a passage that has always stayed with him. It's in the Song of Solomon. He says, Brother Camacho, he says it is the small foxes that get through the holes in the fence that destroy the harvest. The small foxes that get through the fence that destroy the harvest. You see, most of us, most of us are at a level now where, where these demonic attacks that come along, we can pretty much identify them, right? Like, oh no, 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 no. say that's you. I can, I can see that's you. No, 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 see, no, I, I see you. I see you over there trying to get to me. Uh, uh, Sam. I see you. So what the enemy has to do is he has to use those small foxes. He has to use those very small outside influences to get to us. Those ideas, those philosophies, those self-gratifying things that we think of that are not biblical and they are not scriptural. How many of us have those ideas? How many conversations have we had? How many conversations have I had with believers Believers that will tell me they believe in something other than what the Bible says. 
How can you be a believer and not believe in the Bible? I don't get it. I really don't. The only explanation that I can offer you is if we're listening to outside influences. We're listening to the things of the world and we're claiming them as ours. We're claiming them as ours. That's my idea. I don't believe that. Check the Bible. You claim that you love Messiah of the Bible. Check your Bible. And we will bend God's righteousness for our own flesh, for our own self gratification. We will bend the righteousness of God. But you see, it's not a new concept. It's not a new concept. You see, outside rabble, they're not interested in following God. They're not even interested in being part of us. <laughs> what they want to do is they want to influence you. I used to tell my youth all the time, I'd tell me there, I'm hanging out with this person, I'm hanging out with that person, what have you. Do you think I should hang out with this guy? Do you think I should hang out with that girl? Let me ask you this. Are they influencing you or are you influencing them? Let's keep it simple, right? Who's influencing who here? Are you influencing them for the kingdom of God? Are you bringing them to Christ? Or are they bringing you out of Israel? Mm. Are they taking you back to Egypt? Are they talking to you and they're, they're talking up those onions and those leeks and that free fish, those melons? Are they talking, man, you remember the melons back in Egypt? They were sweet and juicy. We should do that again this weekend. We should do that again this weekend. And then we skip church because we're too hungover. over. We start skipping. We start missing. We start not doing what we're supposed to be doing. I want you to think this morning. I really do. Keeping in this vein of thinking. Okay? We are not under full-blown physical, full physical attack. The church. The church is not under full-blown physical attack. Now, there have been moments throughout history that the church has been under attack. Right? There are locations, countries, isolated incidences where a church will get blown up, where people will be shot. But for the most part here at Journey to the Cross, we're really not under physical attack. Right? But we are under attack. We're under a mental attack. We're under a, physical, uh, a philosophical attack. I want to read you something real quick. It's a parable from a guy named Frederick Nietzsche. Now, if any of you ever studied philosophy, you know that Frederick Nietzsche was an atheist. Why are you going to read this stuff? Just bear with me. Bear with me. I've been listening to a lot of... Uh, Ravi Zacharias, if you ever get a chance, listen to some Ravi Zacharias. He talks a lot about apologetics and defending the gospel. Okay? And he drew my attention to this guy. Frederick Nietzsche wrote a parable. It's called the Parable of the Madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in bright morning hours and ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I'm looking for God, I'm looking for God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing together there. They excitedly uh, consider, uh, and they excited and considerably laughed at him. Have you lost him then? Said one. Did he lose his way like a child? Said another. Or did he? Uh, or did he go into hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Or is he? Has he immigrated? Thus they shouted and laughed at the madman. The madman sprang into their midst and pierced them with his gazes and his glances. Where has God gone, he cried. I shall tell you. We have killed him. You and I. We are the murderers, but how have we done this? How are we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained the earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving now from? Away from us, away from all suns. Are we not perpetually falling backwards, sideways, forwards, in all directions? Is there any up, down, or left? Are we not straying as, as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of an empty space? Has it not become colder? 
Is it not more and more night coming on all time? Must not lanterns be lit in the morning? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell anything yet of God's uh, decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we, murderers of all murderers, console ourselves? That which was the holiest and the mightiest of all, that the world has yet possessed, has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe the blood off of us? With what water would we purify ourselves? What festivals of atonement and what sacred games shall we, in, shall we need to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we not ourselves become gods simply to be worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed, and whoever shall be born after us, for the sake of this deed, he shall be part of a higher history than all history. Here the madman fell silent and again regarded his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last, he threw his lantern to the ground, he broke it, and he went out. I have come too early, he said to them. My time has not yet come. The tremendous event, this tremendous event is still on its way, still traveling, and has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars require time. Deeds require time, even after they are done, before they can be seen and heard. This, still, this is still more distant from then than distant stars, and yet they have done it to themselves. It has been further related that on the same day, the madman entered diverse churches, and there he sang the hymns. Let out and quiet, he said, to have retorted each, each one in their time. What are these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchers of God? What Frederick Nietzsche is concerned about in relating the above parable is that God is dead in the hearts and the minds of his own generation of modern men. Killed by indifference, our indifference, mine and yours, that itself directly related to pronounced cultural shift away from faith towards rationalism and science. If we don't live a life of purpose, we live a life of indifference. We kill God. We kill him in our hearts and we kill him in our minds. We kill him by our indifference. We destroy the God that we proclaim. I encourage you today, I'm going to ask you to stand up.
that there have been many years of indifference that are posted to my account. I ask you for your forgiveness now, Lord. I ask you, Heavenly Father, bless my brothers and sisters right now. As we leave this church, Father God, as we leave our sanctuary, as we leave your, your presence right now, I pray that we don't leave your presence. I pray that we think today. I pray that we love today. I pray that we cry out today. I pray that we cry out. I pray that we answer the call of this message with a broken heart. And I ask for your forgiveness, Father. Mashem Yeshua HaMashiach. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Bless them as they work. Bless them in their homes. Bless them with their families, Father God. Bring happiness, joy, and love to every one of their situations, Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray, Father God, that you would cause them to grow, Father. To grow in knowledge and in presence and in spiritual gifts, Heavenly Father. I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Make sure you hug somebody. Make sure you shake somebody's hand.